Thank you all so much for joining me. I think we're all ready to go. I'll just have the YouTube tab open. So we are all here on the almost 25th anniversary of Abdullah Ocalan's kidnapping uh, as part of an international plot for his arrest uh, in which he's still imprisoned uh, in Turkey. Um, you've all been invited by the Women's Weaving Network due to your research, careers, your outspokenness to do with his incarceration and also the wider Xinjiang Azadi movement. So thank you so much for joining us. We're all really uh, pleased and honored. Uh, I would like to start by introducing you all individually and then going into your own thoughts and, and queries about you know, the matter at hand. I'll start with uh, Rada de Souza, uh, who is an academic, lawyer, social justice campaigner, writer, and critic. Uh, she's from India, where she practiced law, though she currently teaches law at the University of Westminster. She has worked with trade unions and democratic rights movements in India with the anti-globalization and anti-war movements. We also have Havin Guneshir, uh, who is an engineer, journalist, and women's freedom activist. Uh, she is one of the spokespeople of the international initiative Freedom for Abdullah Ocalan, Peace in Kurdistan, and a translator of several of Ocalan's books. We also have uh, Paula Martin, a social activist, part of the feminist lawyer cooperative, working mainly with social collectives and prisons, always with a gendered perspective. And she also forms part of a collective that works in developing conscience and tools to face political repression in Europe. I'm very uh, humble to be with you all, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, I think if we could start with Havin, we have some questions for you personally. Okay. <laughs> we wanted to ask you, uh, who is Abdullah Ocalan and how did he inspire the formula of Xinjiang Azadi for those of us who, who may not know? Okay, uh, thank you for organizing this and I'm happy to be here. Uh, especially on such a day, as you have mentioned yourself, that it has been now, with tomorrow, it will be 25 years um, of Abdullah Hojalan's abduction. Um, I, I guess his abduction is one of the early examples of extraordinary renditions that U.S. is uh, very famously is known about. For those of our listeners who don't know what this is, it's actually a state-sponsored kidnapping in another jurisdiction and transfer to a third state. I guess before I answer your question, who is Abdullah Hojalan and how did he inspire the formula? Maybe it will be good to give a bit of a, a background uh, to this um, abduction. Um, Kurds and uh, Kurdish people and also the Kurdish freedom movement call this the international conspiracy. I guess the left is a little bit weary of uh, definitions of conspiracy and plot and all of that. But it, it is therefore very important to understand how did it all happen, because there was no formal arrest at all. It was an abduction, a kidnapping, a, a piracy act, even we call it. And to hand Erdogan over to the other warring party, which is Turkey, who colonizes Kurdistan and who uh, puts opponents and opposition into prison uh, for being outspoken of this colonization and oppression. So, um, in, in fact, I think it was Erdogan himself first who described um, even already in 1998 that this was an international plot because via Belgium, Öcalan had a message from both the Turkish state and also the US, we believe, to um, declare a unilateral ceasefire already in 1998. So when Öcalan declared this unilateral ceasefire, the response came very swiftly. I believe it was around September of 1998, Turkey threatened to invade Syria. 
if Öcalan wasn't handed over to them. So, um, so this is the moment, and the U.S. also um, supported uh, this threat of of Turkey with military, um, you know, uh, maneuvers uh, in the region and etc. So, and from then on, the you know the Syrian regime uh, actually already told Abdullah Hojalan that, uh, you know, there, there, it was no longer possible for him to stay there. So upon invitation, he went to Athens, Greece. You know, from there on, what spiraled uh, from October 9th to 15th of February was an amazing, and we, that's why we call it one of the first examples of these extraordinary, extraordinary rendition is that Abdullah Hojalan could not find any refuge in any of the states that he went to. You know, it, it it's the spectrum is wide. You know, it's Greece, it's Italy, it's uh, Russia. You know, Germany pulled its red bulletin, cancelled it. Netherlands shut its airspace, you know. So all of this actually, in fact, led uh, the Kurds to see, you know, that this wasn't a, a one-state act of Turkey. On the contrary, this was a NATO operation. And Öcalan questioned this. He said, you know, how does it come about that he chose to come to Europe to find a political and peaceful solution to the Kurdish question, but instead he was chased out, chased out to Kenya, where European law would not be applicable. And even, this is the reason why the European Court of Human Rights did not want to go into this abduction at all, because it was outside of its jurisdiction, you know. So, um, so he questioned, you know, why didn't Europe and the U.S. did not want to Question, uh, resolve the Kurdish question, but instead wanted to make it uh, even worse. And, you know, the chance given to Marx in London or Lenin in Switzerland, or even somebody like Khomeini in Paris was not given to Öcalan in Europe. So um, this led him to think very deeply and profoundly about what was going on. You know, what was the the intent, the intention, the goal behind such an ordeal. And I, I guess through this, he um, really questioned the European um, modernity and the Western foundation of revolutionary thinking of the 20th century. So coming after saying all of this, and pointing out that it's 25th year and 75 years of age, he will be almost in, in April. I'd like to describe Abdullah Hojalan as a leading revolutionary thinker of the 21st century who has really developed the art of freedom. And I don't say the art of freedom lightly because he has really come a long way. He has come from the long way when the Kurds themselves did not uh, accept any longer that they were Kurdish, you know. And it was a way that was full of bottlenecks and barriers that were almost impossible to overcome because Kurdistan is divided into four parts. And in each part, uh, there is a colonial state with their own problems, but also they... They, they don't particularly like each other, but when it comes to the Kurdish question, they are able to regroup, to be able to uh, suppress the freedom demands of the Kurdish people. But with this ordeal, actually, Erdogan saw that this was really more than just the local colonizers, that it was the, um, the capitalist modernity and the imperialist, you know, the global powers who impose this on the region. And these four states were simply gatekeepers. So he is the seeker of truth, I guess. Um, he is also the leader of the exploited and the oppressed. Um, he is also, as we are seeing more and more, 
with um, with everyone being able to read his books, that he's becoming the guide and leader of the moral and political society wherever they exist. He's a freedom fighter. He's a political prisoner who has now been kept on an island prison, in fact, befitting the tales of the medieval times. You know, we have not heard from him for more than three years now. The island prison is a military zone um, and there is no information going in or out of it. He is the most trusted guide and leader of the Kurdish people and woman. So I, I don't wanna go on and on because there are others that will speak, but let me shortly talk about how did Abdullah Hojalan inspire Junjian Azadi? I guess all of this, I mean, is a is the topic of a of a much greater discussion. But if I cut cut it short, Öcalan had already been speaking how in the Kurdish language the words jin and jian, which is woman and life, came from the same root already before 1999. He was trying to, you know, this uh, this suffix coming from the same root. Um, led him to question what kind of a life there was in Mesopotamia at the time of the Neolithic, even before 1999. Um, and later, after 1999, when he delved deeper into the question of freedom, not only for the Kurdish uh, people or Kurdish women, but in general, um, he then came across the word freedom and what it means in the Sumerian language. In Sumerian language, freedom is amargi, and amargi is something like going back to, to mother's womb. And Öcalan did not interpret this something like biological or something physical. He interpreted and he put all these together, you know, um, that freedom, was something that existed out of this, you know, exploitation and oppression that existed in the social system that was led by women, which was the Neolithics. So when he made that connection, both in his, you know, discussions um, with family members, lawyers, or the books that he produced deeply into this, I think the women's movement quickly picked it up and turned into the slogan that you know of today. So, um, yeah, I, and I, I think it's a, it's a, as he expressed it, it's a magical formula, and it shows us uh, that that how interconnected and how, in fact, the basis of all enslavements and exploitations begin with that of the woman and that all other enslavements and exploitations are in fact mimicked are, or, or they are, you know, copying in fact this. And we can explain this with many, many examples, but I think I will leave that to further discussion. I think a, a perfect segue into understanding Paula's perspective also of this situation of, of women's place in societies, especially under uh, the colonial situation in which you perfectly described uh, the, the gatekeeping uh, and the, you know, international um, agenda, agendas of capitalism and, and power. Uh, Paula, I wanted to ask you um, about your time traveling with a delegation of women in Bakur and Turkey, where you met uh, women's lawyers and human rights organizations and we wanted to understand um, your experience there. What was the situation, the situation of political prisoners? And um, what were you able to find out about the situation of Abdullah Ocalan in particular? Thank you, Javin. Hello. Uh, hello to every one of us, of you. It's an um, honor to be in here. Also would like to point out my comrade in here, Sis Maria. Um, we will share together the, the interview. And um, yeah, effectively, we were in this last December, we went to Turkey and to Bakur. 
and uh, I, I'm still working <laughs> and invited by the women's delegation. It's the second trip we do as part of YACTA to Turkey. Last year we went with the international de an international delegation of lawyers to also to check which was the, uh, the situation of prisons and especially like uh, the uh, political prisoners. And like to give a, like an overall view in one hand, we can see like in society wise, we see it's a society that or at least our vision is like it's a society that is crumbling down. It's a place like a, the economical, social, political crisis is groaning non-stop. And um, something that we could maybe say that is actually a, a dictatorship like because the social space, like the, the thing we saw is like, even though the coup is meant to like uh, what happened in the 2016, even though the coup is, is meant to like all the emergency um, system is meant to be um, to be over. What we can see is like, uh, in fact, uh, there's still like uh, an emergency situation. So like there's no uh, possibility to do um, uh, strikes uh, like we can see how all the women's uh, rights are like going backwards, mainly like best, like probably the best example is like the fact that Turkey has retreated from the Istanbul Convention. But we can see also how they are passing more laws. Um, like linking it, what the friend having said is like, we, we know like, especially on the court this struggle, uh, the women have a um, special position, like uh, Abdullah Utsalan also say, like, the women need to be the vanguard. So we can see, like, maybe we can have, like, two views on this. One is will be, like, more, like, uh, attacks against political uh, movement. But one is also an attack, and a strike uh, attack against women. And we can see that on the little change they're doing in legislation, just to put an example, like the fact of allowing uh, people to marry the person that's raped, no? That's something that they wanted to pass in Parliament. So these little things, like you can see, like how all the rights of the woman are going backwards. It's also an attack against like the proposal, the, the, the proposal of a new society, a new change. Doesn't matter if you follow uh, Otaland, if you follow different uh, freedom struggles, but like the fact that you are oppressing half of your population, and instead of going up like you're going backwards, that says a lot about the the situation in Turkey. That for us it was um, quite mm, astonishing. It was it was quite hard to see um, the situation of the prisoners. We ask for permission to get into a couple of jails. It, was, it wasn't was even denied. What happens usually with um, with all the establishment in Turkey is like they don't even deny the permit. They just ignore it. <laughs> they, they didn't ignore it. But you know, every year that the um, legal delegation goes there, they try to go and visit um, Mr. Utalan. But we also tried and we really were really interested in going in to see a woman's person and speak with another political person was totally impossible. But what we can see, and it's not only about, because we've been speaking with families, we've been speaking with activists, but also like out of uh, statistics, what we can see is like the situation in the prisons are going like really down. Actually, the situation for all the prisoners inside of the prisons are really, really difficult, especially the situation of women and especially the situation of um, LGTB persons, migrant persons, like the situation inside of the jails is really, really bad. But also we can see how they are mimicking like the isolation, like imposed over Otsalan. Like the extension inside of the same prisons, the extension of the F type prisons, the extension of the all isolation um, methods that they have been now like usually they all, they used to be uh, applied over only men called these political prisoners, and we can see how this is expanding to all the population. And then it's one thing many times, and I think it's, I think that is one thing that we have a lot in Europe. It's like you know, you don't think like prisons are a reflect of society. But like, if, if you see how a country, how a nation treats their prisoners, they, you know how democratic, how uh, progressive um, and a state is. And what we can see in, 
in Turkey is like the actual situation of prisons is horrible. The situation of the political prisoners is even worse, and not only for them. And we can say, I think we can defend that that Turkey is supplying torture against all the political prisoners. And um, maybe we cannot say for sure they are playing physical torture, but we think they do. But um, they are playing torture in, in, in since that they don't allow families to go and visit them. They do not allow them to use their own language. They do not allow uh, them to have a different exchange with more um, people inside of prisoners, like all the punishment. That the, the different types of isolation that have been applied in the Turkey prisons is that like they are well example uh, they, they are examples of um, of um, torture, and especially about Mr. Abdullah Utsalan, uh, we think um, as the friend have been said, it seems uh, last last time uh, he could have spoke with his family was with uh, his brother on March uh, 2020. But uh, it's been only like um, 25 years they, he had like a handful of visits. He's not allowed to speak with the lawyers. We know they are asking. And that's actually, that is torture. There's that is no, is no way of discussing it. And I'm like the CPT um, says that is torture, like the different human rights statements say that is torture. So there's a... There's an, you need to understand why do they they oppress a person that much. And what we can say is like, um, Abdullah Uthalan is not only the leader of uh, the Kurdish people and probably of all, or we can say that like of all the freedom fighters of, um, of the territory, but um, also has a proposal that goes exactly against the actual fundamentals of the national state. So, um, as um, having said, I think it's really difficult to think, or usually we try to think like it's a punishment only against Abdullah Talam, but we think it's a punishment against all the freedom fighters, all the people that are striving for freedom, because he's got a proposal. He's got actually a good proposal of changing the, sta the state, of changing the, the nations we live in, the, the concept of a nation state. So you cannot punish uh, a leader without punishing their people. And you cannot punish a, a leader so important as Abdullah Ocalan if you do not extend that to the rest of the countries. So I say because like we can see like that is not happening only on Turkey. Um, that like this extension of torture is happening all, all over the planet, all in Europe. And one of the things is sort of like is trying to mimic, Turkey mimics like the anti-terrorist politics of Spain, Spain mimics the anti-terrorist politics of uh, Turkey, and it has more to do with uh, trying to keep the establishment than any other thing. We ask for the release of Abdullah Ocala, not only on, on, on the grounds of um, he's been submitted to torture the last 25 years, but also uh, on the grounds of like he's a, a, a freedom fighter and he's somebody that's been struggling for freedom of uh, Kurdistan and all the people. And we think it should be released like right now. Thank you so much, Paula. I would like to come back to you shortly regarding uh, the action that needs to be taken uh, globally. But I think interjecting with uh, Rada's opinion regarding um, the severity of the human rights violations at hand, uh, I would like to know your opinion, uh, yourself as a legal scholar, Rada, uh, why is nothing being done about uh, the extent of his solitary confinement and uh, so-called punishment and justice? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking me to be part of this conversation. It's always a pleasure to speak, but not necessarily. The pleasure is not extend, does not extend to the topics that we are going to talk about, but definitely the people. Um, I will... The, the Kurdish movement and the whole question of the incarceration of Abdullah Ocalan in many ways and in many respects calls out the hypocrisy of the Western legal system and the Western value frameworks, because everyone here will talk about rule of law, you know, equal treatment, and this is supposed to be European values. 
But in this one case, you find a complete demolition of those European values that everyone talks about, and even people who don't talk about really believe in it. Yeah. And let's take the question of the imprisonment. It's an established principle of law going back hundreds of years that liberal capitalist societies have claimed that, you know, free, fair trial, you know, humane conditions of imprisonment, access to legal advice and access to fair process, judicial process. These are all very basic fundamentals. But in Ojalan's case, they are not applied, not only by the political class, not only by Turkey, but even the European Court of Human Rights. So if you look at the decision of the Human Rights Court in Europe, you know, the human, uh, what do they say? They say, yes, maybe solitary confinement is torture, but you see, we can't do anything about it because the states have the right to, you know, talk about it. Maybe he was taken out of Kenya by force, but we can't get into it because it's another jurisdiction. You know, so there is always a reason and it's a very legalized reason. And that finds a way of getting out of what they call normatively the European values. So, you know, and, and this goes across the board for other things as well, beyond this imprisonment, yeah? Now, uh, if you say, you know, like uh, when we went on a delegation to meet the uh, secretary of the committee against torture, you know, which is the ECHR committee, and uh, asked him, you know, why don't you go and see? Because, you know, we can't go and see him, but you go and see him. And you come and tell us what, what the situation is. Is he okay? Is he, you know? But he, he goes there or says he goes there, we don't know. But says, we can't tell you what I saw and what happened there. You know, we can't disclose those things to you. And then in the same breath, they talk about transparency and they talk about public administration. See, it's this contradiction that is important to highlight in this case. It also goes for the reasons for his arrest. He calls for a peaceful settlement of the Kurdish question. And one would imagine that a peaceful settlement, because if it's not peaceful, then you are a terrorist. And we know the whole ambit of you know, measures, anti-terrorism laws, et cetera, et cetera. And that is then justified as, oh, these are all violent people and we can't have it. But here is a man who says, we don't want that violence. Let us settle this peacefully. Let's sit down and talk about it and come to some peaceful solution and actually offers a pathway to a negotiated settlement. And nobody wants it. And nobody wants it. And we are supposed to believe, you know, that we are all for peace and settlement and everything. We should talk about it. We shouldn't fight. We shouldn't pick up arms. We shouldn't do any of those things. We should, all things are negotiable. Let me just make another point, which, and then I'll stop with this. You know, the question of right of nations to self-determination. It is written in the UN Charter. The UN Charter says people have a right to self-determination and they have a right to struggle for self-determination, right? This is not me saying it, it is there in the Charter, okay? Now, here is a group of people who say, we are actually a unique and distinct nation. We want to be able to govern ourselves, you know? And they say, oh, but no, that can't apply to you. But the law exists, yeah? And then you are put in a situation where if you fight for it with arms, then you are a terrorist. If you don't fight for it with arms and ask for a peaceful settlement, then also you are imprisoned. So it's a no-go situation. So I think one of the most important things I want to highlight for me about the Kurdish question is that all the normative claims 
all the claims about European values, about the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera, is completely demolished by this one case. And I'll just stop there. Thank you so much, Radha. I think uh, you so insightfully demonstrated the double standards that are very much at play and have been for a very long time that we're seeing unfold in very, very catastrophic ways at the moment across the Middle East. Um, so thank you. And actually, you also uh, you bridge, uh, in my mind, to something Javin mentioned earlier regarding uh, the kind of existentialism that's brought about by witnessing such double standards, such hypocrisy. Uh, and in this uh, realm, in this space, I wanted to ask Javin again, uh, why, you know, Abdullah Ocalan's writings cover a lot uh, because of all those experiences and all of those learnings. And as you say, the seeking of truth. And I wanted to know, in your opinion, why the women's freedom struggle is so important to Abdullah Ocalan. Thank you again, Rada. <laughs> okay, um, I, I think there are a lot of different factors. One factor is is that you know some it's ingrained in his personality that he even from childhood picked up contradictions. You know, and one of the earlier contradictions that he picked up was in relation to his uh, female friends you know, with whom they used to play on the street, you know, and uh, go to school together. And then all of a sudden, one day, he could no longer play with them, you know. And he recited this over and over, even before 99, after 99, that he never found this very ac acceptable at all, including the way his sister was also given to marriage. So there is that aspect of it, but there's also... Afterwards, when he became the leader of a revolutionary movement, uh, he was able to then look at what happened in real socialism, what happened in Soviet Union and other places uh, when it came to women's and men's equality and freedom. He saw what happened to national liberation movements, what happened to feminism. You know, how it was later really isolated inside the universities and in elite circles instead of, you know, encompassing the whole society. Uh, so, but most of all, he saw it himself in his own movement, you know, what these contradictions and conflicts uh, were bringing about or, you know, how it was played out. Um, despite the fact that it was a revolutionary movement and they were all comrades, you know, there was, there is no marriage inside the Kurdish, you know, like inside the PKK by the cadres. But despite this, you know, he saw that traditional relationships were being repeated and it was coming to surface in various different forms and shapes. So already before 1999, uh, in, in trying to overcome, you know, the bottlenecks of real socialism, and this is why, you know, when capitalism with the collapse of Soviet Union wanted in everybody's mind declare that this was the end of time and, you know, the socialism had no hope and capitalism was the way to go, you know, um, I think he responded to, responded to this as saying with with the saying that um, you know to 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 believe in socialism is to insist on being human. So uh, therefore, he deepened, actually picked up on this contradiction, and he deepened uh, both his understanding, uh, but also not only that um, by creating mechanisms both inside the organization and outside to be able to overcome this to the benefit of the freedom of women and the whole society, you know, because um, he also, like people before him, 
believed in that, you know, a woman's level of freedom represents the level of freedom of the society. But, but I think, you know, and you know that, you know, he had things like the rupture theory, the internal divorce, not only for women, but also men, for men, eternal divorce from the system, you know, and to kill the dominant men, he declared it to be the, the foundational principle of socialism, even before 99. So, but um, he saw that, you know, uh, just like Kurds being the motor behind the Middle East becoming more democratic, um, women were actually the motor behind the whole society losing its shackles because it's layers of and layers of enslavement. It's a relationship set up uh, between initially between men and women, but inside the whole society. And he 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 saw himself responsible for finding a response to this question of freedom and to overcome it, you know. So I, I think it, it is phenomenal that he was able to refine it, refine that, that how slavery was achieved, you know, to three points. You know, it's an ideological construction and he goes and proves this, you know, in Sumerian texts, how women is falling from grace to say it, you know, from being goddess to slowly being made out of Adam's ribs and, and how he, her economy is appropriated, her values, you know, um, and then how force and violence is used if women do not, you know, come to her senses, so to say. And, in the earlier question, I had mentioned that, you know, uh, this was mimicked, you know. We are seeing that this kind of exploitation and enslavement can be true for Kurds, can be true for, you know, the indigenous peoples in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, for the societies and for the women. Um, therefore, he saw that women's freedom you know, goes far beyond equality of sexes. And then I think from there on, it wasn't very difficult for him to see the rest. I guess before 99, you know, he did not make that rupture with the state, like most of the left, even today, we find a lot of the left still thinking that state can be democratized and it can be used for good, you know. But he made a very clean break from this. And I guess you can see his argumentation and discussions through the 13, what we call books, but they are defenses to various courts. Um, you can see this argumentation and this, this discussion. Um, I, I guess, you know, he didn't want to, he, he said that, you know, like, I, I, you know, why should we repeat everybody else? Um, I, I guess, you know, just like states learn from one another over the 5,000 years, um, revolutionary movements has to learn from one another throughout all these 5,000 years that they have been struggling. So I guess it was uh, very important that, that he found the source of the problem. So the woman's enslavement and exploitation, like everybody believes maybe, it is not the result. It is the source of how the patriarchal system became a world system. Thank you. Spartacum, how have you really? And as a, you know, these works have been developed over a long time and as you say, pre-arrest, during imprisonment. And I have a question here specifically for Radha, but I would also love to know your opinion, Harin and Paula also, if you have anything to add afterwards. Uh, Radha, what influence does Ocalan have on the international uh, context regarding his works and how they are received or perceived? 
Well, I don't know if I can speak about the international context as such, because the international is literally the whole world. Yeah. But uh, I can, I think, say something about what I think is the significance and why, you know, people should pay more attention to, I mean, whether they agree with it or not is a matter of debate, of course, but still you still need to know what the arguments are. I mean, for me, I came in touch with the Kurdish movement when we were trying to form a coalition of different groups in London to work on political prisoners and solidarity for political prisoners. That was my you know, introduction, if you like, to the Kurdish movement. And for us in India, I come from India, as, as you have already said, um, state violence against women is a very, very serious issue. I mean, in some ways, patriarchal violence is an old violence. You know, we know that for a very long time. But state violence against India, against women, is a very relatively a modern issue and an issue that comes with colonialism. Yeah. And uh, indentured labor, those women indentured laborers who were transported, you know, I mean, it is obnoxious. I can go into details of it. But, you know, for example, you know, the indentured labor of women who were shipped, they would always make sure that the number of women were less than the number of men, because then that gave them a way of controlling the men. So, you know, I mean, to that detail of administration. And now, of course, after independence, state violence against uh, women has exponentially increased. So this was also my, you know, uh, a point of contact with the Kurdish movement where we organized panels on women political prisoners. Everybody talks about political prisoners, but there are not many people who talk about women political prisoners. And what that tells you is that women have no political agency. You know, they just tag along. The men do the politics, they tag along. But the fact that the sheer numbers of political prisoners who are women today is something that... So these were the points of contact and we in South Asia had all of these questions, you know, Tamil struggles, Kashmir again, the way women have been forced to come out to defend, you know, things. Manipur now, the ongoing violence in Manipur. So for me, it was these kind of things. And it seemed to me that the Western feminism had kind of reached a dead end. You know, the white Western feminism to deal with property equality, because our problems are not about property equality or about getting jobs. Of course, it's nice to get jobs and, and all of that, but that's not the real issue. And here was a man who was saying that this issue needs to be taken seriously, you know, and not many contemporary political thinkers are willing to say, Everywhere, not just the Kurdish women, women must be put front and center of politics because this has a long, long history. And I think this was one of the reasons that, you know, at least for me, I began to think that people at least need to understand this argument. But there is a second aspect to this, which is that the historical, you know, the starting point um, men, there are many feminist movements who will link women's oppression to economic oppression. But here is a thesis that says, you know, the very state formation, the formation of the state, the institution of the state, women's colonization was the starting point of that, which is something that strike, struck me a lot because in South Asia as well, if you look at the history, you know, it we were matrilineal and matriarchal societies until in historical terms, quite late in time. In fact, there are many parts of South Asia that continue to have very strong matriarchal and matrilineal traditions. 
even in Indonesia, which is, you know, supposedly, which is an Islamic country. But if you look at the social systems there, they have a very strong, the Islam has not been able to erase the matrilineal and matriarchal systems that pre-existed. And there, you know, what we call Arabization of Islam, which was introduced because of all the modern imperialist Middle Eastern politics, actually created so much rupture in the women's movements because suddenly families were arguing, is the woman going to look after elderly parents or the man going to look after the elderly parents? Because, you know, that in a matrilineal system, women take responsibility for all that. So, you know, these were the kind of issues that really drew me to this question of can we, A, look at the woman's question differently and pull it out of the dead end that white feminism has reached? And secondly, can we bring the agency of women in the, to the front and center of politics? These are the questions that women in South Asia are talking about. You know, I won't say international. I'll just stick to my region, including in Afghanistan, you know, which is again, and very few people know that Afghanistan had a very strong women's movement, very left-leaning women's movement. And the whole representation of Afghan movement completely changed with the imperialist politics that came into, you know, and there were women in fact, who have been murdered, who have been killed, who have been executed, you know, as a result of all the things that are happening. And that brings me to the third international component, which is that the oppression of women today is, at least outside of the West, is very closely related to the imperialist politics in the regions. In the Middle East, it plays out in certain ways. In South Asia, it plays out in South and Southeast Asia, it plays out in different ways. But I think this is central. And that is why you will find that even where people have not heard about Ochala, it's the women's movements who are really pushing political agendas forward. Thank you again, Radha. And if Paula. Hello? la palabra I don't know if you can hear me Rada or Havin I I think Ophrian is gone offline I'm back thank you keep going <laughs> <laughs> thank you so uh, I don't know if following with the question you made to you, Rada, I would like to point like, um, totally agree with like the feminists has got maybe on a, I don't know, maybe on a cul-de-sac. Um, we don't really know to which is the attitude we should get. At least in the territory we inhabit, like it's Europe. But I think in, for us it's like, um, the thought of Uttalan arrived more not through the women's liberation movement, but I think it did got like it got more grounded in the fact of um that has a proposal for all the different nations to to grow together to decide um like to uh, who do you want to be with who do you want to build your future how do you want your territory develops. And that in Europe, that is like, at the end, is like um, the cradle of the colonialism, the cradle of this uh, of capitalism, is um, the, the fact that, that we are like, yeah, the, the, the origin of the nation state makes that this struggle for like the old nations, like the natural nations of Europe, to try to fight for their self-determination, it makes us like closer to the thought of um, Abdullah Ocalan. And in the same hand, like one thing that I will answer later, but I think that is one of the reasons also because like there is that much um, we try or like all institutions, this, the countries in Europe try to repel that much the work of Ocalan is because it questions the whole Europe. 
the whole settle of the European territory, the actual nation states that we live in, all of them that they've been built on colonial, uh, colonialized in different places outside of Europe and also colonializing our own old nations. And I think Spain is a really good example of that because we have like, we come from Catalonia, well, I'm from Madrid, but we live in Catalonia. And Catalonia is one of the places that is trying to get closer to the struggle of um, Kurdistan. I would love to say that it makes like on equal conditions, but it does not like, I mean, it works uh, trying or it helps to recognize Kurdistan in the ground that it helps itself. But it's not because uh, in Catalonia as a state, as proposal of the state, we are questioning capitalism. As I rather say before, or have been say before, it's like in here we know um, we're not speaking about capitalism. We're speaking about new states. And following that is like also all feminists in here is totally crossed by the state. So what we see, as rather said, is like. The, all the struggles for freedom that are like closer to ground, they are led by feminist movements. And all those feminist movements are feminist movements that are outside of the institution. So are usually anti-state. So, but for us to think like all the, like all the links with Abdullah Talan come first through this critic of the, of the system and this critic especially of capitalism. But it brought us to a point that, especially with all the works of the French in genealogy, is giving us a tool to be able to, to mount all of this, you know, working through the hair story, working through going back to different communities. We are being able also to challenge the actual situation and the, the actual uh, design of the state that we are living. But I have to say that for us, I think one of the main problems to uh, being able to to build the bridge with the rest of the struggles is exactly this. It's like we live in in the in the nation of the nations of states, you know, and that is something that is getting really difficult to challenge because you you cannot say I'm supporting your struggle if I'm not looking inside of my own struggle and say, okay, it's Europe who allowed the colonialists in Middle East. It was Europe who allowed like um, the breaking up of Kurdistan in four parts. And it's Europe who is allowing like Turkey attacking uh, the Kurds, Turkey attacking Rojava. So it's difficult if we don't go inwards and we challenge the capitalists in our place. Thank you so much, Paula. I think uh, to build on your mentioning of the European structure and uh, acting uh, and resisting within this framework. Javi and I wanted to ask about your work uh, as part of Freedom for Abdullah Ocalan uh, and what you feel you have achieved in this time, uh, socially, internationally, and the ways we can bridge uh, all the developments that have occurred since in starting this work. Thank you again, Paula. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that it is obviously not only the international initiative, there is a huge um, organization of the Kurdish freedom movement itself. The international initiative is part of this and was established uh, after the abduction back in 1999. But if I am to say in general, not only the initiative, but in general, um, I, I think that, you know, um, what has been achieved is that, especially what Öcalan has achieved, I think I'd like to go with that and then maybe later only mention a little bit about what these campaigns have done. Because uh, the campaigns since 1999 have certainly come a long way. Um, because back in 1999, nobody hardly knew Öcalan or the Kurdish people. You know, I remember when I was a teenager, not so long ago, that, you know, people didn't know what the Kurd was. They they thought it was the bean Kurd. It was something, it was a vegetable, you know, or, or something like that. So with the abduction back in 1999, um, what happened is that the, 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 the standing, the positioning of Öcalan himself elevated him 
to another level and the embrace of the Kurdish people also. Because if you would remember, more than 100 people self-immolated, you know, from October to February, Kurdish people were on the streets, both in Kurdistan and all over the world, especially in Italy. And they knew that, you know, they, 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 he was symbolic. He was, he, he symbolized the fate of the Kurds. That if had, if something had happened to him from past experiences, that it would be their turn. So they knew how interconnected they were with his fate. So um, therefore, I think there are huge gains since 99 from a leader that wasn't really nobody heard of him outside of the Middle East. He now is a leading revolutionary thinker that actually filled a vacuum that existed after the collapse of the Soviet Union by putting together a huge narrative, not only for the Kurds, but for all those struggling to build their own system outside of the nation state or state in general, you know. And I think to this end, you know, he, he as I said, in, in total, he has 60 books, but um, out of prison, he has 13. So with great clarity, he has, you know, pinpointed the, the pitfalls uh, that have allowed many different movements, including the PKK, to fall into them, but only to get up and, you know, point and to try to overcome them. So I guess, you know, there, there are gains in terms of questioning the, the foundations of uh, capitalism and, you know, the class and the stated civilization. I, I don't know, you know, one has to think about it to say, if there was no so, such abduction, if Öcalan himself had not faced the reality of European democracy and modernity, had he delved so deep, you know, I'm not embarking on saying, you know, it's a good thing that happened, but what Öcalan did is turn this around, you know, and through this, what we are seeing is that, you know, instead of a bitterness, he turned this around and he tried to really expose what is going on. You know, who is playing what part? You know, not only Turkey, but also CIA or US or NATO or Germany or this or that, even to the point of the, the man in the house, you know, uh, or, or us women. You know, how are we playing all our parts? Um, therefore, I, I think that, you know, these translated into physical spaces like Rojava, you know, also, of course, in Turkey, too, with the HDP project, there was a huge illumination of, of knowledge and what was going on there. ISIS, you know totally failed. I mean, can you imagine the political landscape in the whole world? As Radha also pointed out, look at Afghanistan, you know. I mean, it has now been accepted, the regime there, the, the regime that they supposedly fought for a long time. They bring them in now to Europe to have, you know, official meetings. So I guess, you know, if the Kurdish people and uh, internationalists and people in the region at the end, especially in Northeast Syria, had not taken a stance, you know, in accordance with the vision of Abdullah Hojalan, I guess, you know, we would see a totally political landscape, not only for the Middle East, but for whole of Europe and perhaps the, the world. So, um, uh, therefore, I, I, I think that, you know, another achievement, uh, I think, especially 
you know, what Öcalan insisted on is to open up ideological, philosophical, political, and organizational space for um, women's autonomous organization. And he convinced, you know, the population about this. Because I guess one of the things that he's critical of feminism is that, you know, that that women restricted only with themselves. And so he tried to then convince the male as well to take part in this Freedom Act of not only women, of but themselves, you know. So I guess all these things were, were very important. Um, so what did all these things that we, we, we did across the 25 years, what did it contribute to? I think it totally countered the, the, the effort, not only by Turkey, but those forces that did this NATO operation to render him invisible, you know. Instead, with the translation of his works, people picked it up all around the world, you know, and joined in the signature campaigns, joined in the demonstrations, the hunger strikes, the juridical and political efforts, you know, which, you know, we forced the the um the death penalty to be to be lifted, you know, because as I said, Kurds, I mean more than a hundred of them burned themselves. I, I think at the time Madeleine Albright, you know, the it, he was the she was the foreign affairs minister, she said, okay, we never expected such an action by the Kurdish people. And, and they had to, we believe, change their plans accordingly because they became that force to change the, the, the plans that they may have wanted to implement, like maybe, um, uh, maybe, you know, like uh, uh, kill him on the way or something, you know, before he was, it would be, handed over uh, to Turkey. So, um, so you know, there, we have come a long way, but we have not yet ensured his release. And I guess this is so critical at the moment, especially when we look at what is going on in the Middle East, in the world. Um, he himself called it Third World War. And it's getting more bloody uh, the more we, we, we go. But at the same time, there is room for really rupturing, as he has argued over and over from this system. Um, only we need to take this last step, bring all our forces together to make sure that we turn the tide, you know. Um, this is why, like today, we, we made a made a statement as, as the international initiative. And we called it his freedom is really our freedom. Öcalan's freedom is your freedom. Because this restriction, this limitation, this taking back the hard-won rights step by step, turning us all into players in the same regime is bringing more bloodbath. So he is in fact the symbol then of, you know, um, uh, uh, progressive or advanced development and freedom for peoples and women in the Middle East and which will have a great effect everywhere else. So we are on the good path, but we are, we are running out of time, I have to say. Thank you again, Javin. Uh, you managed to uh, really build uh, your own world of, of hurdles that are then kind of met with the successes that, you know, fuel hope and, and furthering, uh, which I wanted to tie going back to Paula uh, and what needs to be done to end the uh, inhumane conditions of isolation uh, and the imprisonment of Abdullah Ochiman. Thanks again.
It's a pleasure to listen all of you, I have to say. Like, it's just a really honor to hear all of you and your analysis. We're really, like, as Rada said, just know that we enjoying you to the topic, but you, we really enjoy, like, listening to you. What we think is, like, we can uh, divide it into lines. Like, it will be one, it will be, like, being more formal. What can we do or what should be done on the formal world or, like, on the legal world? And... Um, it's a path that we cannot abandon. And uh, like all friends, like Kurdish people, especially never abandon. You've been struggling in every uh, field, no? like um, from the mountains to the um, to the courts places, from the school to the street. So we should uh, keep following also the formal thing, like trying to press not only Europe, we're doing to actually today we pass a little report to the CPT again, like this uh, one of the collectives working in here is the Observatory Contra la Tortura. And we've already passed another pre another release trying to push them a bit to at least say something. I mean, we know which are the limits. <coughs> so we, we have to follow like uh, trying to press uh, like Europe like that. But um, trying to press Spain for us is quite difficult because Spain is actually one of the main um, collaborators with Turkey. It's got like Spain has got a lot of economical interest there. So that's something that we also have to challenge. Like we cannot only go through the like the formal ways of trying to have all political parties or like the international uh, human rights court. And we cannot stop this. So yeah, we have to press the CPT, we have to press all the international rapporteur and keep telling them, keep making them face the truth, like Mr. Uchalan is being submitted to isolation, to torture during the last 25 years. That in one hand, like it's more like we're speaking like on, on legal things, no? But um, as like also Talan say, but that's something that the friends from Ruyava say once and over is like, we need to struggle in here. There's no way we're going to change something if we don't change our, our reality, you know. There's one thing that I think it has um, uh, sparkled a, a lot in Europe and probably also in Avia, in Avia Yala. It's been the, like the fact that the proposal of Uchalan is free to be read, like we can adapt it. I mean, and one of the directions that also Uchalan say, but especially the friends from Rojava say, it's like there's not something we can make copy and paste. We need to develop in here with our own, um, we need to build a different in here. So I think we have to struggle in those things, following the formal things, and we will keep pressing like the international structures, but we need a change in Europe. There's no way we're going to be able to press Turkey to a breaking point. If every time that we criticize something like, say, Turkey, you are torturing people or you are like with all the pushback of migrant people we cannot say we cannot actually make a fundamental um critic if my country is doing the same it's what spain is doing so to try and as uh, having say we're running against time like i mean we don't have that much time in one hand because the actual world is in, is in crisis and in the other hand is because the situation of abdullah Uchalan is also critical but um, I think uh, we need to press all states, not only to critic Turkey, but to change themselves. There's not going to be a way of we can actually uh, be mindfully, be uh, actually practically uh, good to, to achieve something if we don't change the reality we are living in. And for us, I think the lines drawn not only by Mr. Ocalan, but all the people that are struggling, like all the freedom fighters, and especially, I think for us in Spain, it's quite important the example that Rojava is given. It's trying to build new structures, new ways of life that can face also, not only on the formal, but also on the living sphere to, to face the countries like the state nation we're living in. So it's a bit like, I mean, it's not that has a, um, I say, much perspective on it, but like, yeah, we will keep doing the formal pressure, but for us, I think it's more important to try to, to transform our life. Thank you so much, Paolo. I think it was, um, it was of course, very profound and fundamental to touch upon the, the need for on the ground work across the world for 
people to completely uphaul uh, and, and change the structures they're living in. Uh, as we're seeing at the moment, genocidal complicity is being targeted and actioned against across the world. Uh, and I think people are, are really seeing or becoming disillusioned by the, the societies they're living in. Um, so I think that was a very uh, astute perspective. So thank you, really. Uh, that was technically our last question, but I guess to end on a on an uplifting note, I think it would be really interesting to know what you all look forward to uh, as the Xinjiang Azadi movement only continues and grows and furthers. Um, or you can keep it to a 2024 perspective, if you like. Uh, we could start with uh, Javi. <laughs> Okay, I hadn't muted myself. Okay, I, I really think that, uh, you know, despite the fact that the, the states are becoming uh, more fascist and the political parties are going more to the right uh, as we speak, um, you know, not only in the Middle East, dictatorships, but also in Europe, you know, states are becoming militarized as we speak. Um, and, you know, their interventions, their limitations of, of freedoms in the society um, is, is becoming much worse, and we feel it also in Europe. But I think, as I said, it is offering uh, quite new hopes, um, because I really like the way that Erjalan defines peace, you know, and that, you know, in Europe, Erjalan says, because Erjalan sees the contradiction um, the main contradiction, not as class, but main contradiction in terms of state against society, you know, and and therefore, um, you know, he is, uh, you know, he then furthers it by saying that in Europe there was partial peace, you know, due to the, you know, uh, workers' movements in Europe and women's and you know, other people's struggles in Europe led to such a democracy, you know, such an in-between, a disguised uh, state, let's say. Um, but this is, this, this um, partial peace is now collapsing. You know, we are seeing the states for what they are. Um, and I think throughout, because of the different diverse struggles around the world, uh, we know so much more than we used to know, you know. And this regime, this, this, this system does not offer anybody anything anymore, you know. In the past, it kind of did. You know, you could go to school, you could become this and that, you know. But more and more, what we are seeing is the further uh, breakup of humans from nature, you know, humans from society, humans from one another. So the collapse of this solidarity, um, social life that, that kept it going, you know. And, and therefore it leaves actually no other option for us but to rupture from this system once and for all. Now, the problem is to, of course, you know, get to the people, get to those in the society and to be able to really discuss all of these and to bring it all together to turn it into a change, you know, um, because what the world system is trying to do is to individualize and compartmentalize everybody and to show as if our problems are different. You know, but but I think, you know, Erjalan has shown and given us that um, self-confidence, like we saw it in Kobani. You know, he said, you can do it, do it. You know, he showed it for SED people in Mount Sinjar, Shengal, you know. Yes, you know, you don't have to watch genocides. You can get up and do something, you know. So therefore, I, I think that 2024 is not just the the uh, the time when the World War Three is going to become more rapid and more bloody, but it's going to become more rapid in terms of societies and women 
organizing themselves better in order to defend themselves, defend life, defend earth and defend each other. But for that, I think I want to invite everyone to come to the rally on the 17th of February, which is in two days uh, or so time. No, today is the 14th. Yeah. So it's you know, on the 17th to Cologne, Germany, you know, so that we can actually begin uh, screaming this and to to begin to make that change happen. So thank you for organizing tonight. And like Paula also said, it was an unfortunate topic, but it makes us aware, but it was an amazing discussion and I am so honored to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would love uh, closing thoughts and uh, mm. Reflections from Paula and Rada before we before we say goodnight and a final thank you. We, thanks a lot. Thanks having it's been really nice. Yeah, we were discussing in here with Maria, and I think it's too like we're living in a crisis. Really, one of these well, capitalism has been in crisis also always. Like it's a system that lives in crisis, so it's only like crisis go faster and faster. But as having said. Also feminists, also the different um, freedom struggles are growing faster and faster. It's probably true that um, like in the world that we live, it's difficult for us to reach the many people. But it's also true that if we see like this, um, we, we call it here like the red thread that uh, links all the struggles. I think we've got this violet thread that links all the women's struggle in the world all the movements in defense of the territory and all the movements in defense of life. And all of them are part of the same, like they are different, they are magic, they are like, they've got their own uh, di difference, but all of them are defending the same. They're defending women, they're defending life, they're defending the land. So from that, I mean, at least I'm happy because I think that it's a base groaning. It's a base groaning and probably it's not groaning in Europe. You no, know, we will be like, it's not in here where it's going to get stronger, but it's Abia Yala, it's Middle East, it's, um, it's the rest of the world, and probably not in Europe. But um, actually, we're waiting to see how that explodes because we think it's going to be like, really, it's going to bring, it's going to be able to bring a new start. Uh, we would love to be on the 17. It's going to be impossible for us, but we'll do little things in here. And we'll try to start every day with these things, with uh, this thing of we're going to change everything. We're going to change the world and we're going to be able to to, um, to achieve the freedom of all and the freedom of everyone. Thanks a lot for, um, for this time and for allowing us to be part of this meeting. Okay, I mean, I, I will try and keep it brief and also if possible bring in a little optimistic tone to this um to this conversation and i'll just make three very brief points first i think we have we started off this conversation about with talking about ojalan and his imprisonment and all of that but i think if we really want to, we are serious about the freedom for Ojalan. It can only happen, it cannot happen just by focusing on one individual. It can only happen when there is a broad democratic environment that is created within which this issue can be raised. And uh, for me, I think everywhere now, because states are become na becoming nakedly fascist. Not that they were very, uh, you know, compassionate or anything before, but now everybody can see it. Uh, and, and everybody can see the economic tyranny, the political tyranny, the police, the racialized state, and all of that. And therefore, I think there is uh, a receptivity among people because they're searching for answers on how can we push a more, a different kind of society and freedom. And therefore, I think become building broad-based democratic movements becomes a central call for the, our times. 
The second issue that, uh, that is closely related to the rise of fascist states is uh, or the exposure of fascist states, not the rise of, they were always had fascistic elements to them. But the clear visibility of this comes alongside a real threat of another worldwide war. And I think we are, we cannot underestimate this kind of situation that we are in because all the unfinished business of the Second World War is now coming back. The First and the Second World War is now coming. So if you look at the Kurdish question, it was part of the mandate problem that started off in the First World War. And all the mandate territories are under problem. You know, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Kurdistan, you know, all the Palestine things. And likewise in other parts of the world. So this is also an opportunity to democratize movements, political movements, by bringing the focus and the relationship between, on the one hand, fascistic states and the wars that we are, that ultimately we will be the ones who pay the price for it. And lastly, I will emphasize that we cannot underestimate the importance of knowledge because in the present condition, especially with all the, you know, complete, um, you know, misinformation, disinformation, the whole selective, you know, uh, 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 release of information, the extent to which things go on behind closed doors that we don't know about. We cannot democratize movements if we do not have the knowledge and if we do not have alternate knowledge systems. And this is something we cannot underestimate. And all of this, underpinning all of this, is this one thing, organize, organize, and organize wherever you are, whether you are in the women's movement, whether you are in the trade union, whether you are in your village, wherever you are and whatever you do, I think the only way this can be pushed forward is by movements organizing and the grassroots and pushing things forward and building solidarities. So I want to actually thank you for this uh, event that you have organized and given us all an opportunity to talk about things you know, in an open way. So thank you very much. Sorry about that, we're back again. Um, it's very special that you all had such uh, messages of clarity and sharpness that give me nothing to conclude, uh, but rather plenty of time to thank you all. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for organizing and for the effort that you have put into it. Thank you, everybody. We, we don't remember that we cannot talk to each other. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this night. We, we have to go. And it's been a pleasure. Hope to see you again and hope to be able to organize with you. That it will be really nice. Even in the distance, it will be brilliant. So have a good night. And thanks a lot for preparing this. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thanks a lot for organizing this. Goodbye. Thank you.